So we're going through um, Matthew. We're nearly, we're nearly finished, Matthew. Today's talk is called Come and Get Your Love. I always thought you might be a bit more excited about that. I was quite, I was, uh, yeah, yeah, I knew, I, knew, I knew you would be, Suzanne, but uh, you're always excited. Um, Steve Holt came up to me beforehand, um, before the worship started, and he said that the Lord had given him uh, a word, and we love sharing what the Lord is saying. And uh, Steve's word this morning that he felt God saying to him was, hold fast to the word of God in good times and bad. Read it, know it and feel it. What a great word that is. Hold fast to the word of God in good times and bad. Read it, know it and feel it. And again, it fits in with what we've been talking about last few weeks and what I'm talking about this morning. You see, if you want to move in the spirit, you've got to be rooted in the word because Ephesians 6 says that the sword of the spirit is the word of God. The sword of the spirit is the word of God. We will put our foundation somewhere. If we rest our foundation on the word of God, we'll find that it works. The word of God is load-bearing so that you can be fruit-bearing. The word of God is load-bearing so that you can be fruit-bearing. It takes the strain. God's word takes the strain. It reminds you of who you are, redeems your past, nails you to the present and propels you into the future so that you can bear fruit. So hold fast to the word of God in good times and bad. Read it, know it, and feel it. That's great, feel it as well. Hopefully people will be feeling things this morning as we're preaching. So, I shall now move on to the talk. Where's my little talk gone? Here it is. It's Matthew 26. Um, Jesus anointed with oil at, at, at Bethany. I just realised, as I was, a couple of things. Like, it's such, it's such a privilege to preach the gospel. Like, it, it really is. Like, people have said to me um, quite a lot, Andy, I notice you get emotional when you preach a lot of the time. And, and that's true, and I don't, I don't do it deliberately, it just happens. Um, but I was trying to work out, because I'd rather not get emotional when I preach. I was trying to work out why it was, and I, I had some revelation this week. I get emotional when I hear myself saying something that I could only say if Jesus actually was Lord. Because you know what, I don't, I don't want, I didn't ask for any of this. Like, I, didn't, I was a reluctant convert to Christianity at the age of, of 22. I think I wanted something else, to be, something else to be true. I wanted a different story to be true, but I was convinced that, that Jesus was who he said he is and was. But I didn't want to preach the gospel. When God said to me a few years ago, I want you to go around the world preaching the gospel, I said no. Because I wanted to be a comedian. I, I wanted that to be my full identity. I wanted to be on Live at the Apollo. I nearly was on Live at the Apollo. I nearly got on it. And I didn't quite do it. But I was resentful when he said preach the gospel. Because I thought that was a lesser, that was a lesser calling. I didn't want to preach the gospel. And now actually it's the only thing I want to do. I want to spend my entire life, the rest of my life, however long I've got left, preaching the gospel, telling people that there is a freedom and a love that they didn't know about. So when I get emotional, it's because I hear myself saying things that I could only say if Jesus actually was Lord. If I actually did really believe the stuff that I was saying about him. Because being a Christian is hard. Like We're one of the most godless nations in, in the world. I'm an evangelist. I, that's, that's my job and it's my role. It's my, it's my office, if you like. Whenever I go out sharing the gospel, I'm, I'm terrified. Before I start talking to someone the first time, I'm absolutely terrified. And I think it's cringeworthy as well. I do think going up to people blind and telling them that God loves them is cringeworthy. But then you think, well actually, compared to what? If that's cringeworthy, what's, what's relevant? People say that Christians are, are cringy and, and Christianity is, is uncool. Well, compared to what though? Compared to culture, compared to what culture tells us. But you know what? What culture tells us is constantly changing. Culture is, is transient. In the 1960s in America, it was culturally acceptable to dislike black people. Culture said that was okay. Culture changes the whole time, which is why we hold fast to the word of God, because it's unchanging, and is always good, and it never lies. And it always builds people up. I think I get emotional because I hear myself saying things that I just realise are, are, are true. You know, Christianity might not be... I remember in the 90s, when I was in my, in my uh, teens, I remember looking back at, my, at pictures of my dad from the 1970s in his flares <laughs> and thinking, Dad, you look like an idiot. 
And I was there in my massively baggy Ben Sherman shirt, thinking, I look amazing. I now look back, sort of 20 years later, I now look back at my dad from the 70s and think, Dad, you, you look like the boss. Like, you look amazing. Yeah. And like, I look at myself and think, I didn't need to close that baggy. I was quite slim back then. I didn't need baggy shirts. What was I thinking? Why was it so shiny? <laughs> culture changes, culture shifts, fashion changes. When people say that, you know, Christianity is cringeworthy, they're comparing it to what they're comfortable with, to what they've been told they should be comfortable with. But we don't, we don't abide by those societal rules. We hold fast to the word of God. Thank you for that, that word, Steve, because it's, it's true. We hold fast to the word of God. We hold fast to our identity, which is hidden with Christ in God. And that's why we can be secure. That's why we can be secure in our, our identity, because it doesn't change. We have to come into a knowledge of, of who we are. We have to recognise who we are. But it's there for us already. He chose us before the foundation of the world. As God was creating the universe, he was thinking about you. <coughs> Not just you as a collective, but you individually. He was thinking about you. I realise that there's a lot of excuses I make, though, for coming into God's presence. I'm going to read you uh, some... I was researching excuses, and these are some genuine excuses that people have given for why they couldn't come to work. Okay, these are genuine excuses for not attending work. See how pathetic these are. First one, these are all genuine. I reached out to grab a falling sandwich and splintered my elbow. The sandwich, which started life as meatball marinara, was also ruined. That's why he couldn't come to work. <laughs> Number two. Someone glued my windows and doors shut so I couldn't get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> Number three. My teeth flew out of the window whilst driving. <laughs> These are true. These are genuine. <laughs> Number four. I was bitten by a duck. This is true. I, I accidentally got on a plane. That's another one. I had a lucky night and didn't know how to get home. Two more. I can't come to work because a fortune teller told me if I left the house this week, I would die. And then the final one. Um, my grandmother tried to poison me with ham, again. <laughs> Those are ridiculous excuses. They're, they're true, I didn't make them up. They're ridiculous excuses. But I also then think, you know, I often come up with equally ridiculous excuses for why I, I don't spend time in God's presence. I'm constantly letting myself off for why I don't spend time with God, why I don't read the word. And I love it, like I love the word of God. But I often, when I wake up in the morning, I often check Facebook memories before I check Galatians. I'm constantly giving myself excuses for why I don't spend time in God's presence. And I don't know why, because I love it. Like I love being in God's presence. I love hearing his voice. I love getting words of knowledge. I love hearing him tell me things about myself and about people who he loves. But I'm constantly giving myself excuses. One of the things I've been challenged on a lot recently, um, one of my favourite preachers, uh, who's an American guy, he said, I can't afford to have a thought in my head that's not in God's. I can't afford to have a thought in my head, in my mind, that's not in God's mind. If you think about that, that's, re that's really challenging. But it's good news because the thoughts in God's head about you are really good. Psalm 139 says his thoughts about you are more numerous than grains of sand on a beach. He's thinking about you all the time. And he loves you. He loves you and he created you. He has a desire for you to know freedom and joy and hope and peace and purpose. These things that you are wired for. When we come in here and if you're new here or you're a visitor, it might be weird to see people raising their hands in worship. I would, when I was in my kind of late teens, early twenties, I would have thought that was moronic. 
I would have come in here and said, what are you doing? Why, who are you, what are you putting your hands up for? It's not a football match. Who are you worshipping? Well, you're worshipping the guy who saved you and who rescued you and who's given you your identity, who's restored you. Like, I've realised recently how I explain it to people when people say, it's a bit weird, it's a bit cringeworthy, people putting their hands up. Yeah, sure, but you just need to understand, like, God's our dad. We're his kids. And when we're putting our hands up, it's like a toddler. When the toddler grazes their knee, they run to their parent, don't they? They say, Daddy, Daddy, pick me up. I'm here, Daddy. Pick me up. I need you. That's what's going on when Christians are worshipping. We're reaching up to Daddy, to our Heavenly Father, who loves us and knows us, knows us the best and loves us the most. And that's what our identity is. And that's the thought that we can't afford not to have in our mind. You can't afford to believe anything other than God is your dad and you are his child. And that is a relationship. God is not a factory owner. He's not a drill sergeant. He's not the demon headmaster. He is your loving dad and he desires for you to have that relationship with him. And if you believe anything other than that, if you don't believe he wants that relationship with you, then you are believing a lie. And it's not your fault, you're not to blame, but you still need to stop believing the lie because it will keep you away from the truth. Because of Jesus, God is approachable. Because of Jesus, God is approachable. Jesus says, if you've seen me, you have seen the Father. Jesus, Hebrews says, Jesus is the full radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. Like we have access to the Father through the Son. And this is amazing when you compare it to every other religion. Every other religion will tell you that you can know things about God, but you can't actually know him. You can't know him because he's not knowable. He's not imminent. He's not coming to find you. He's not looking for you. In Lord of the Rings, The Fellowship of the Ring, uh, which is the first one, I'm assuming you, you've all seen it. Uh, I'm in it. <laughs> Starring Andy Kind as Gollum. At the end, when they've been, they've been attacked on the banks of the Anduin uh, by the orcs, and uh, Boromir, Sean Bean's being killed, as he always is. Sean Bean dies in everything. And... Um, Frodo, played by Elijah Wood, decides that he's going to go to Mordor on his own. He's going to go to Mordor on his own. So he gets into a boat and he pushes himself into the river to decide to go off on his own. And, and Sam, who's his kind of his mate, he's like the sort of the, the Timothy to his port, to Frodo's Paul. Sam sees that Frodo's going on his own and he doesn't want to let him go. He doesn't want him to go off on his own. So he races to the, to the shore and he starts to swim into the river. But the thing is, because he's a hobbit from Hobbiton, he doesn't live by the sea, he doesn't know how to swim. So as he tries to get to this boat, he starts to drown. And Peter Jackson, who's an amazing director, he leaves it. We see Sam drowning and Peter Jackson leaves it. So it, even those of us who have read the book think that Sam has drowned. And we feel this massive sense of injustice. Oh no, it's not fair. That's not how it was supposed to be. Sam was just trying his best to get to Frodo. And then of course the hand comes, Frodo's hand comes underneath the water, grabs Sam, Sam's arm and pulls him into the boat. And they go off and that's the end of the film. What's the point of that? Why are you sharing that? Well, first of all, because I like Lord of the Rings. I'm allowed to talk about it. <laughs> Deal with it. Every other religion, every single other religion is the story of Sam, us as Sam, before the hand gets plunged down under the water. Every other religion is the story of us having to swim to a distant God. There is this distant God, he's in a boat in this scenario, and we've got to swim to him. By our good works, we've got to swim to him. And if we can get to him by our swimming, great. If we can't get to him, great. He's not bothered. He's not coming to get us. And he might be giving you good advice. He might give you good advice such as be a better swimmer or should have laid off the taters precious or something like that. <laughs> but he's not coming to find you. He's not coming to get you. 
The story of Christianity is the story of the hand being plunged down underneath the water, grabbing your arm, taking you to the surface, putting you into the boat, and saying, just take my hand and I'll rescue you. I know you can't swim alone, but you were never supposed to. That wasn't the plan. I will save you. Come and be with me. This is why we call it the gospel, because it's good news. Other religions will give you good advice, and they will give you good advice. Religion gives you good advice, but I don't want good advice. I just want good news. I want to know who I am. I want to know that the guy who created all of this knows me, likes me, loves me, and that I can know him. And Jesus says, yeah, well, you can. That's why I'm here. That's the deal. You can. Come to me. You can have this freedom, this joy, and this love that you know you're wired for. You can have the identity that you know you were supposed to have. God is approachable. Let me just read the passage, which I should have read at the start. Jesus anointed at Bethany. While Jesus was in Bethany, in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came to him with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, which she poured on his head as he was reclining at the table. When the disciples saw this, they were indignant. Why this waste, they asked. This perfume could have been sold at a high price and the money given to the poor. Aware of this, Jesus said to them, Why are you bothering this woman? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, but you will not always have me. When she poured this perfume on my body, she did it to prepare me for burial. Truly I tell you, wherever this gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of me. What I love, like if, if you think Christianity is sexist, you need to read about how Jesus treats women. Like, this lady, this lady is nameless. Some people think it's, it's Mary Magdalene, but in the passage it's nameless. She's nameless. And yet Jesus says, wherever the gospel is preached, people will know about this lady. And I think there's a reason why it's left nameless. I think it's because it's supposed to be for all of you. Ladies and men, but specifically in this case for for ladies. Because look, what, look what's going on. This lady, she's surrounded by the apostles. The ultimate heroes of the faith. There are people more qualified to come to Jesus than she thinks she is. And yet she comes and she brings this oil, this nard. And it would have been her life savings. If it was her oil, it would have been her life savings. It was the equivalent of a year's wages. And she comes to him and she pours it over him. And the apostles, the greatest heroes of the faith, say, what are you doing? Imagine that. Imagine being rebuked by the apostles. Like, what are you doing? And Jesus says, what are you, t what are you bothering her for? She's done a beautiful thing. She's come to me. She's come to spend time with me, which is the most important thing that you can do. This lady is nameless because, because she's you, ladies. She's you. You might be thinking there are people more qualified to come to Jesus, more able to come to Jesus, more, I don't know, more worthy to come to Jesus, and Jesus disagrees with you. Jesus disagrees with you. He says, no, you, you, come. Bring me what you have. It's enough. And this lady agrees. She said, I'll, I'll give you everything I've got. A year's wages for a moment in your presence. Jesus rebukes the heroes of the faith because of this nameless woman. Because this nameless woman is you. And Jesus wants you to come to him to experience his love, his presence, because it's life changing. And if you don't understand how he feels about you, if you don't understand that the gospel is not performance based, then you are believing a lie. Isaiah chapter 1 verse 18 says, 
come now, let us settle the matter. Though your, skin, though your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. God says, let's get this sorted once and for all. Though you've done many things wrong, your sins are like scarlet, they will be as white as snow. You come to Jesus and it's all dealt with. It's all dealt with. That's how he sees you. That's honestly how he sees you. What I love about this as well is that it's a great, it's just a great scaled down version of the gospel. It shows that, you know, you can't do the works without the grace. You can't do the works without grace. Galatians 6 says, let us not grow weary of doing good. And that's right, we shouldn't grow weary of doing good. But if you're trying to do good without coming to the source of goodness, then you'll burn out. You can't do the works without the grace. If you try and just do the works without understanding how much you're loved and coming to rest in your relationship with God, you will either, you'll either puff yourself up into pride at how pleased God must be with you for all the good works that you're doing, or you'll implode into crazy self-loathing and worthlessness because you'll think other people are better than me, I can't do this. None of us can live the good life that we really want to. And Jesus says, look, just come to me. Just rest in me because I know you. I know you the best and I love you the best. Like everybody else, you're my favourite. Come and spend time with me. We can't do the works without the grace. We're not saved by works, we're saved for works. We're saved so that we can do good works. And it's great, faith without works is dead, that's true. But you've got to understand, first of all, your identity, which is that when you come to Jesus, you are saved. That is, it is honestly paid on the nail. God keeps his promises. His promises are not yes and no, Second Corinthians. His promises are not yes and no. They are always yes and amen. When he says to you, you are mine, he means it. He doesn't change his mind. I was at Centre Parks, told you, and I, um, I'd been, I've got, been going to Centre Parks on and off for the last 30 years. And in 19, for, for th like many years, in the early 90s, I went on the football course and there was this guy who used to play for Chesterfield called Phil Walker. He used to play up front for Chesterfield. And uh, he, he's, the, he's still the football coach at Centre Parks. And in the early 90s, he knew me, he recognised me, he knew me by name. Because I went on every football course, and I loved it. I was always player of the course because I was such a keno. And he was brilliant, and I got photos with him from the early 90s. And I saw him there this week, I saw him this week, and I went up to him. I said, Phil, hi, I'm Andy Kind. He said, oh, hello. And he didn't know me, he didn't know me, he didn't recognise me. And even when I told him about all the conversations that I could remember that we'd had, I was friends with his son and everything. Like I'd been there for several years, he said, I'm sorry, I don't remember you. And I was gutted. I was absolutely gutted. Well, how can you not remember me? Do you not remember that goal where I, I beat three men and put it into the top corner, even though it had gone out slightly? It should have been a throw into the opposition. I just didn't let on because I wanted to score the goal of the tournament. Do you not remember that? And no, I don't remember you. And he said, look, I just, I, I've, met, I've met thousands of people. I said, yeah, fair enough. Like, if he had all the thousands and thousands of people who he's trained at football over the years, like, he wouldn't pick me out from the crowd. But you know what? With God, it's totally different. It's the opposite. Jesus does pick you out in the crowd and say, hey, you, I know you. I've always known you. I created you. I've given you your identity. I've given you your gifts. Why don't you come to me? Are you thirsty? I'll give you something to drink. Are you hungry? Well, I'm the bread of life. Are you tired? I'll give you rest. What are you carrying that's killing you, that's burdening you, that's, that's weighing you down? Did you not know that my yoke is easy, my burden is light? He picks you out in the crowd, all of you. He says, you, you're mine. You're mine. Come. Come into relationship with me. Come and let me show you that you're mine. Get your hands up, daddy, daddy. We can't do 
the works without the grace. We need to understand the grace. Some of these words, like what does it? What does yoke mean? Yoke is the thing they put around the the, the cattle's neck that caused them to help them to carry the cart. That's what a yoke is. And what do we mean by grace? Like grace is a word that gets banded around. Grace just means undeserved favour, not a favour like I'm going to give Tom a lift home or something. But preferential treatment. Grace means preferential treatment that you didn't ask for or deserve. See what time we're doing. Oh yeah, great. Jesus says that, it, that we can come to him and through coming to him into relationship we can, we can get our full identity and we can know the Father. Because of Jesus, we, God is approachable, like eminently approachable. So let's approach him. And you know what? We, we need to approach him. We need to approach him because there's certain things that we need to give him and certain things that we need to receive from him. Because as I've, I've said several times since I've been talking here at Redeemer King, God is not the allocator of love and light and life. These aren't qualities that he invented and gives to you or puts somewhere in the universe. He's not the allocator of love, life and life. He's the source of these things. These things exist in his presence. In his presence is fullness of joy. He is love, he is light, he is life. If you want these things, you've got to come to him. There isn't a place that God can put you to be happy without him. It doesn't exist, that's just the deal. He didn't invent love, he is love. That is his nature. Do you know what though, it's always a trade with Jesus. The Bible talks about a trade, a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, fullness of life instead of what the thief comes to kill and steal and destroy, his death for your life, his fullness for your emptiness. It's always a trade. But to have the trade, you've actually got to come to him. You've actually got to come to the cross, come into his presence. When you come to him, the stuff that you the stuff that you can give him, you can give him what's troubling you. We're all in pain, like we are all in pain about different things, and there's there's no like that's not a bad thing. That's okay to be in pain. You're not condemned for feeling pain, but pain can only go in one of three places. We find in our lives that pain goes in one of three places. We either turn it outwards and it becomes blame. Like, I am in pain because of this person. This person has done wrong to me, it's their fault and I'm going to turn my pain into anger, I'm going to blame them. So pain can go outwards into blame. It can go inwards and it becomes shame. The reason I'm in pain is because I'm worthless. I'm not a good person. I'm not like these other people. I don't look presentable, I don't have a good job, I don't have enough money, like, I don't have gifts, I'm not creative. All these absolute lies. It comes inward and it turns into shame. That's what most people do with their pain. They turn it into blame or they turn it into shame. And Jesus says, well there's a third place you can put it. You can actually just put it on the cross if you want. You can bring your pain and put it on the cross and leave it there. That's what he means when he says, it is finished. It doesn't mean the pain is not real, it just means that it, <laughs> you don't have to carry it. Like there's, as lots of you know, there's, there's stuff I've been in a lot of pain about over the last kind of couple of years of my life. And just points I've said to God, look, I just can't carry this anymore, I can't deal with this. You're going to have to carry it for me. And he says, okay. He says, okay. He doesn't say, mm, well, I'll have to think about that. Because, well, well, you know, you are, you, you haven't been a very good person, Andy. He doesn't say that. He says, brilliant. You've got it. Give it to me. Like, do you not know that God can carry whatever you're struggling with? One of the lies we're told is that we're supposed to be strong people. You're stronger than you th think. You're not stronger than you think. You're just as weak as you fear. But the great news is that where you are weak, he is strong. He's mighty. The Bible doesn't say, <laughs> he, 
His strength is made perfect in high performance. It says very clearly, his strength is made perfect in our weakness. When we're weak, his strength is perfect. Not just fine, adequate, perfect. You don't have to be strong. Because you're not, you're not, but it's, that's not, there's nothing to be ashamed about. Like, performance is irrelevant. How loved you are is what counts. And his strength in you. It's Christ in you, the hope of glory. Not being a good communicator in you, the hope of glory. Not being really good at your job, the hope of glory. Not looking like you're a good person, the hope of glory. Doing lots of good things, the hope of glory. Christ in you, the hope of glory. His strength is perfect when we're weak. So we get our pain and we have to bring it to the cross and we nail it there. That's why he says it is finished. It can go outwards to blame. It can go inwards to shame. It can go upwards onto the cross and it can stay there. It can stay there. All the pain no longer gets to win. So we give him that. And then we receive from him. We receive. There's a few things that we receive. When we come to Jesus, he will redeem our past nail us to the present and propel us into the future. First of all, we receive identity. Now, everybody knows that we have an identity. Like, I don't know if in the 90s it was very common for students to say, I'm going around, I'm going to Asia to find myself. People would say, I'm going off to find myself. And they'd always come back and end up working at McDonald's. That would always be what would happen. <laughs> but when people say, I'm going off to find myself, that implicitly gives away that they believed that there was an actual original factory setting of themselves that they could find. And if atheism is true, if there is no God, then that's not the case at all. Like, the meaning of life is just to give life meaning. And that sounds fantastic, as we talked about before. If the meaning of life is to give life meaning, then Hitler nailed it. Hitler's one of the most successful members of our animal species. He captivated the hearts of a nation. He took on the greatest powers of the world and nearly won. If the meaning of life is just to give life meaning, and Hitler nailed it. He's a better person than you and I. Because on, on atheism, it's just evolutionary biology. There is no good, there is no bad, there is no justice, there is no judgment. There's just survival. You survive for as long as you can, as well as you can. That's all you have to do. And people do live like that. But we know, I think, don't we, that there is a... There is a me, there is a self that we can discover. And when we come to Jesus, when we spend time with him, in his word, in prayer, listening to him, in community with other Christians, we get sharpened, iron sharpens iron, we get the corners knocked off us and we, we, we realise, we come into a growing knowledge of who we were born to be. So we receive identity when we come to him. When we spend time in the word, when we spend time in prayer. We receive truth. You see, the, the word of God is just full of truth. And it claims to be as well. Psalm 102 verse 18 says, Let this be written for a future generation that a people not yet created may praise the Lord. People say the Bible's old-fashioned. Well, you would, you would expect, I think, <laughs> you would expect, I think, that if, if God has been around forever and his wisdom has been unchanging like it might have been written down a long time ago like if it's tr if it's true it doesn't matter when it was written down we're so guilty of chronological snobbery don't worry mark i'll tell you what it means later <laughs> chronological snobbery is from the problem of pain by cs lewis it's uh, it's about saying that like oh, we understand the truth now we are We've got it. Our generation has got it. That's what it means. But it's not true. It's, it's an everlasting word. It's a timeless word. We come to him into his word, into his presence. We receive truth. We receive truth. In the New Testament, your sins are not spoken of as dying. Your sins are not dying. They're dead. 
Every time sin is mentioned in the New Testament, it's dead. It's not dying. It's not a process. Your sins are not living and active biblically. The thing that's living and active is the Word of God. Sharper than any double-edged sword. So why do we trade that? Why do we flip those two around? Why do we live as though our sins are living and active and the Word of God is dead? Well, because if we don't come to the truth, we believe lies. Satan's job is to get us to believe lies rather than truth. Which is why you've got to come to Jesus for that trade. Swap the spirit of despair for the garment of praise. Swap the lies for the truth. Paul says, think of yourselves as dead to sin. You are. You actually are. So think about it that way. You've been given the mind of Christ. Use it. Nearly finished now. Oh, there's my picture again. You receive truth, you receive, receive identity. You receive forgiveness. Like, forgiveness is a, is a, it's a dirty word almost, isn't it? Like, guilt is a dirty word. There's, one of the things, again, we're told is that, oh, you shouldn't feel guilty, you mustn't feel guilty. Guilt, guilt is a perfectly natural response to real-world circumstances. Like, when you feel hunger, it's because you're hungry. And when you feel hungry, none of us, when we're hungry, say, oh, I'm such an addict. I'm addicted to food. I'm so ashamed of myself. No, we, we, when we feel hungry, we think, okay, at some point, I'm going to have to have something to eat. So we, we do that. When we feel guilt or shame, feeling it is not our identity. You shouldn't stay guilty. You shouldn't stay ashamed. That's correct. Those who trust in the Lord will never be put to shame. But when we feel guilty, it's often because we feel like we've done something wrong. So in the same way, when you're hungry, go and get something to eat. When you feel guilty, go and say sorry to somebody. When you feel ashamed, bring it to the cross. Receive your identity, which is that you are not performance-based. These things go unchecked and they kill people. Like guilt unchecked, shame unchecked, disastrous. But feeling guilt is just a signpost to the cross where you can bring your guilt and you can bring your shame and you can bring everything else and you can leave it there and you can receive fullness of life. Give and receive. It's always a trade with the Lord. I was praying, since I've been in Chesterfield, I was, I was praying, I was because I was probably feeling a bit full of myself because I love that we're going after the last, the lost and the least. I love that. That's our motto at Arcane. I love it. And I say it a lot to myself. I was like, God, this is great. We're going after the last, the lost, and the least. It's brilliant. And the Lord dropped a picture into my mind of a guy who I went to primary school with uh, called James. His name was James. And I hadn't thought about this guy for probably 15 years. And he dropped in, the picture dropped into my mind. And I just started weeping. I started weeping. Because I realised that I'd bullied him. Like, I knew I'd bullied him, but I hadn't thought about it because it was a long time ago. And the Lord just, I just, the grief came. I mean, it was, I was on the floor. There was snot everywhere. It was gross. I felt stupid. But something was happening. Like, the grief of the fact that I'd bullied him was coming out. And I said to God, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. Forgive me. And of course, Jesus says, yes, of course I forgive you. Of course I forgive you. As we confess our sins, he's faithful to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But we have just got to give it to him. We can't let it go unchecked. And amazingly, I said, I said to God, Look, uh, please give me the chance to say sorry to this guy. And the next time I was in Stoke, when, when I went to school, I went to see my mum and dad, and driving to my mum and dad's house, and I see this guy walking his dog. He's walking his dog, and I stop the car, I say, like, excuse me! <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> he said, Christian, you're Christian. Are you Christian? No, he wasn't the same guy. <laughs> I went up to him and he said, oh, hi, Andy. <laughs> like, he'd see, because I'm a comedian, he'd see me on, on the internet and stuff. Because I, I, oh, you, you remember me then? He said, yeah. I said, mate, I just want to, I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian now. Christian, I'm Christian. I'm a Christian. And I wanted to, I really wanted to just come and say sorry to you. Because I bullied you. And I'm really sorry. 
I'm really sorry. He was like, well, it was a long time ago. <laughs> like, he wasn't really that bothered about it, but I was bothered. I knew I had to do it. I was like, oh, can I, can I pray for you? He said, yeah, fine. Again, again he, wasn't that, he wasn't that fussed, but I was fussed. And I was blessed because I had the chance to redeem something. I had a new identity. Since I've become a Christian, a new identity. I don't punch down anymore. I build up. I don't tear down. I try and build up. Because that's what God does. That's what Jesus is doing in the passage. You, the person who feels unworthy, the person who feels like the least important person in the room, you come to me. She anointed him with oil. She anointed him for burial. She noticed something that the apostles hadn't noticed was that he was going to be killed. She'd seen who he was. And she came to him and he was able to give her a glimpse of who she was. Just by, just by that, that revelation. And also one commentator said that the oil that she put on him was nard and it was so pungent, so strong, it lasted for days. So the idea is that even as Jesus was being beaten and tortured and crucified, the smell of that anointing oil would have been on him. The, the encounter that she'd had, this woman had had with Jesus, would have been with him at the end. I just think that's amazing. Final thing. Final thing. Well, two, second final thing. Receive help. Receive identity, receive truth, receive forgiveness, receive help. Uh, at Centre Parks, uh, Heidi, who's my three-year-old, she, uh, we were on the beach and she had this bucket and she'd broken the handle to come away from the, sort of the, the pannier bit, the bucket bit. She came over to me, she stood at sort of where uh, Tom and Chris are now and she said, uh, Daddy, fix it. I was like, great, I'd love to fix it. Yeah, easy, come, come here, give me, the, give me the, oh, she'd given me the, she'd given me the bucket. She was kept hold of the handle. She said, uh, fix it. I said, I will fix it. Give me the bucket. Give me the handle. She said, no, fix it. I will, f I honestly will fix it. Like it's, it's not, it's not difficult for me, Heidi. I'm, I'm daddy. If you give me the handle, then I can fix it for you. You've got to give me the handle. No, you fix it. Like, honestly, Heidi, nobody wants to fix it more than me. Like I am mad keen on fixing this bucket for me, but you've actually got to give it to me. No, you fix it. And it went on, uh, probably 40 minutes, probably, in real life. <laughs> the point is, like, God wants to offer himself. He wants to offer help. He wants to offer his word, his good news. But we actually do have to come to him. We do actually have to give him everything. There's no point saying, like, I'm feeling really addicted to something if you're not prepared to let God change your mind. If you're not prepared to actually give up the stuff that you're suffering with and struggling with and give it to God, then what are you expecting him to do? Because he's not going to force it. He can't force love on you. He's not going to force you under duress to accept his, his care. You've actually got to give him the stuff that you're struggling with. And he says, I'll fix it. No, it's easy for me. Come to me. I'll give it. Give me the bucket or whatever it is. What? What? Oh, you'll never know. <laughs> well, we'd booked in pony trekking later on because we're very middle class, so um, we didn't need to worry too much. Yes, I did fix it. I'll bring it in next week as a sign of redemption. <laughs> um, receive boldness. This is the final thing. Receive boldness. Boldness is... Boldness is... A, yeah. <laughs> Not boldness. We've been blessed with the gift of boldness, Paul. <laughs> Firefighters will be celebrating too. <laughs> I'm not touching every bold man's head. We are reforming right said Fred later on. Me, Paul and Chris. Can you let me finish the talk, please? I try to be serious and you guys ruin it. Boldness is another, is another kind of word that we, we shirk at. But actually, boldness isn't aggression. Boldness is just fearlessness. Boldness is just not having any fear. It's not aggression. We mistake it. We, we equate boldness with aggression, I think. Jesus loves you. You must repent and believe. That's not what, but that is aggression. But boldness is just fearlessness. Like, if we want to, 
if we want to step out and share the gospel, and Jesus does say we need to go make disciples of all nations, we do need to be bold. Or bald. I'm both, so like either way I've nailed it. We do need to be bold, but we can't do it on our own because we don't have that strength. We don't have that fearlessness. We need to come to him and let him encourage us. People say, I don't feel, I don't feel comfortable about sharing the gospel. Well, that's why Jesus said he'll send you the comforter. Like He's got all this thought through. He's planned it out. He said, I'll send you the comforter, the Holy Spirit. You're supposed to be uncomfortable so that the comforter can show up. That's the deal. It's okay to feel uncomfortable. Oh, I feel, I feel, and I'm talking about myself here, as the, as the evangelist. Like, oh, I feel, I might, look, I might look silly. You might look silly telling someone that God loves them. Yeah, people might think I'm weird. Okay, well, whose opinion counts to you, Andy? The opinion of people or the opinion of the guy who loves you and saved you and has told you to go and share the gospel because it's worth it. We give ourselves excuses. I was bitten by a duck. I couldn't share the gospel. <laughs> me and uh, me and uh, JB the third, Josh Boston. We were in uh, Sorbo Lounge, and um, great place to go. You should definitely go. And this guy comes over, and he had a tattoo. The the, the waiter, he had a tattoo uh, which said, um, I can't remember what he said. Something like, uh, "The future belongs to those who believe in the power of their dreams." That was it. And he went away, and I thought, well, that, that sounds a little bit like uh, Psalm 37. Commit to, the, commit to the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. Uh, and I said to Josh, I'm going to prophesy over this guy. So um, I felt like the Lord had given me a picture, and this guy came back. And the people who witnessed this are still alive today. <laughs> this guy came back, and I said, mate, um, we're Christians, cringeworthy already, I was terrified. I said, we're Christians, and I just pray for you. I, I, God gave me a picture of you, and you had your own establishment, your own restaurant, and you were using it to uh, bring in homeless people and feed and, and support and look after homeless people. And this guy was like, it's interesting that you say that. I was like, oh yes. Really? He said, yeah, I, um, well, when I was 17, I was homeless. It's true, isn't it? So when I was 17, I was homeless, and now I, I, work, I work with a charity that looks after homeless people. Like, God had spoken to him. He, God had, had told him his heart's desire. And we said, well, that's amazing. Like, I, I said, look, I don't know anything about you, but God knows everything about you. Can we pray for you? He said, well, I'm not religious. Well, <laughs> no, what, who, what do you think's just happened? We haven't made this up, mate. Like, who do you think it is that's speaking to you? So we were able to pray for him and, and bless him. And he, he was just blown away. The idea that there is a God, like he would have been thinking about the fact that there is, the idea even, the possibility that there's a God who knows him and, and knows his future and has plans for his future. Even though this guy doesn't acknowledge God, God acknowledges him. Jesus acknowledges him, knows him and loves him and has plans for him. He knows the plans he has for him, plans to prosper him and give him a future and a hope. See, this is the God that we serve. It's not, we do not serve a God who's going around looking to punish people and dish out retribution. We have a God who's going around looking to get his kids back. God wants his kids back. At the end of, you, at the, end of the railway children, which is always a good place to end, we're, we're finishing here. Shall we have the band back up to do one more? You can come up. Sorry, it's a bit late. Sorry. At the end of the railway children, in the railway children there's these three children and their, their dad gets uh, arrested for a crime that he didn't commit, like the A-team essentially, and um, gets taken away to prison and they don't know where he's gone and they don't see him for ages and they wait by the railway and he doesn't, he doesn't arrive. And then right at the end of the film, Bobby, who's played by Jenny Agatha, she's at the railway station and there's a big crowd of people and they're all looking at her. And the smoke clears, and she sees this guy on the platform. And she goes racing towards him, and she says, My daddy, my daddy! My daddy, my daddy! That's who he is. That's how he wants us to approach him. But unlike the railway children, he's not distant, he hasn't gone away. He's here. He's not far from any of us. And he wants you back. He wants his kids back. 
He wants you to run to him with your arms aloft and say, Daddy, Daddy, I'm here. I need you. Pick me up. Because he knows you and he loves you. And in his presence is fullness of joy. So like the lady, the nameless lady in Matthew 26, let's, let's just come to the Lord. Let's give him what we've got, whether we think it's a humble offering or we think we've got loads. Let's give him what we've got and let's receive from him. Receive love, receive truth, receive purpose, receive identity, receive forgiveness, receive encouragement, receive help. You see, it's always a trade. Religion is so corrupting. Religion tells you you have to deprive yourself without filling yourself. You have to give stuff up with nothing in return. The gospel is this. Give up the stuff that's killing you and receive fullness of life. Amen.